your opening remarks. Good day and welcome to this webinar to present this first volume of this major new history of ecumenism, a history of the desire for Christian unity. My name is Stephen Brown, and I am editor of the quarterly journal of the World Council of Churches, the Ecumenical Review. Thank you for your participation. And before we start with the presentations, I would like to begin with some technical announcements. First, this webinar is being broadcast both on Zoom and on the YouTube live stream of the World Council of Churches. For those of you following on Zoom, we offer interpretation between English and French. And to select your language of choice, please click on the globe icon at the bottom of the Zoom window. Some of the uh, presenters will be speaking in French, so if you need French interpretation, please click. If you are French speaking and you wish English interpretation, also please click to select the English channel. Those following on YouTube, however, will have the English feed on the webinar, and either the feed of those speaking English or the interpretation into English. Please also make use of the chat and comment functions on Zoom and YouTube if you wish to make comments. At the end of the presentations, we hope to have time for some questions and comments from you as participants. I should say at once how honored we are at the World Council of Churches that the director and editor of the publication, Professor Alberto Meloni, and Dr. Luca Ferracci suggested the book be presented in Geneva during the week of prayer for Christian unity. It seemed very appropriate. Of course, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had to move the presentation online, but which means on the other hand, we now have the opportunity and possibility for worldwide participation. So thank you for registering and joining us for this Zoom. In a few minutes, Professor Maloney and Dr. Ferrari will present the project uh, to develop their history of the desire for Christian unity, introduce the volume, and say a few words about the future volumes. After that, our three panelists will offer their own perspectives on the volume, and this will be followed by an opportunity for comments or questions. But first we will hear greetings from the Acting General Secretary of the World Council of Churches, Professor uh, Dr. Reverend Johan Sauker, who is a priest of the Romanian Orthodox Church and has been Acting General Secretary of the World Council of Churches since April 2020. Unfortunately, uh, last minute commitments meant that he cannot be with us in person but he has recorded a greeting for us. Dear professors and colleagues, eminences, dear friends, let me begin by saying how much I appreciate and welcome the publication of the first volume of this new history of ecumenism, or as the title of the project puts it, the history of the desire for Christian unity. I particularly wish to thank Professor Alberto Meloni, the director of the project, and Dr. Luca Ferracci, the editor of the history from the Foundation for Religious Studies in Bologna for the proposal that it should be launched during the week of prayer for Christian unity in conjunction with the World Cast of Churches. I was able to get acquainted with this project when I was in Bologna last year for the G20 Interfaith Forum that was hosted in this city. And I'm grateful for the webinar 
which will allow this publication to reach much wider audience. Thanks again, Dr. Ferracci, for making me visit your foundation, for showing me the manuscripts you worked on while producing and preparing this volume for publication. I'm grateful. It is sometimes said that a generation which ignores history has no past and no future. And in some ways, the same might be said of the ecumenical movement. We need to understand and be acquainted with our past to look towards our future. And this volume will help us do that. At a time when wider society often seems to be focused on what is immediate and what is in the here and the now, taking stock of our history can help us understand better, not just where we have come from, but our tasks for today and for tomorrow. In his introduction to the volume, Professor Meloni underlines that the history should not be understood as an institutional history, neither as a history of an institution, nor a history produced by an institution. Instead, Professor Meloni speaks of the history of the desire for unity, the Christian desire for the unity of the churches, the history of the church's desire for the unity of Christians, and the history of the desire for the unity of Christians. In this history, writes Professor Meloni, not of concepts or models, but that of men and women. A glimpse at the table of contents of this volume shows the many ways from the 19th to the mid 20th centuries in which women and men manifested the desire for unity in their lives and witness. I am particularly happy that the volume is being presented at the beginning of 2022, the year in which the World Council of Churches will hold its 11th assembly. It reminds of all those who have preceded us and of the history on which our present and future is built. The message of our last assembly in 2013 in Busan declared, and I quote, we intend to move together. Looking at the journey of the churches and the ecumenical movement from our funding assembly in Amsterdam in 1948 to Busan, the delegates in Busan wanted to emphasize that ecumenism, the desire for unity, is about moving together step by step, growing every day in mutual accountability, building trust in each other, deepening relationships on the common journey and finding creative responses to the challenges old and new for the benefit of all. When we gather in Karlsruhe, we will do so under the theme Christ's love moves the world to reconciliation and unity. The theme is a reminder that our desire for unity 
does not come from our own resources, nor is it self-regarding or self-absorbed. Rather, our horizon is the world that demands reconciliation and unity. And our desire for unity is nurtured by the love of the triune God manifested in Christ. Let me conclude now by thanking once again Professor Meloni and Dr. Ferracci for this welcome initiative and the panelists will contribute their own perspectives on this history. Professor Dr. Mikhail Kusinski, Professor Elizabeth Parmentier, and His Eminence Archbishop Job of Telemessus. As an Orthodox theologian, I am particularly grateful <clears throat> And the first chapter of the book is by John Zizulas, Metropolitan of Pergamon, who for many years ago also served in the WCC Secretariat for Faith and Order. Thank you very much for your wonderful work. And I wish God's blessings on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Sauka. Now I would like to invite Pastor Lawrence Mottier to say a few words and present a greeting. Pastor Mottier was elected yeah. moderate, moderator of the Compagnie des Pasteurs et des Diacres de, de l'Église Protestante de Genève, the company of pastors and deacons of the Protestant Church of Geneva, in February 2021 and took up her three-year mandate in June 2021. As we are looking today at the history of churches, one thing that I think it's important to note is that the company of pastors, of which Pastor Mottier is now the moderator, traces its history back to 1541 when it was established as part of the implementation of John Calvin's ecclesiastical ordinances in Geneva. Pastor Mottier. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm very pleased and honored to represent the Protestant Church of Geneva and to be able to share with you warm wishes and greetings on behalf of my church. As a pastor and moderatrice of the company of pastors and deacons, I look forward to being associated to the event of releasing the first volume of Ecumenical History, especially at the beginning of this year's week of prayer for Christian unity. In my own ministry, I was deeply influenced by my experience at the Celio Colleges in the UK, where I spent one year with past pastor and professors Holland Vigor and Kali Lombe. I had a chance to visit a great variety of Christian communities, experiencing spiritual ways, sometimes similar and sometimes very different from my own. In accepting the discomfort and the challenges, I've been able to discover the joy in celebrating with others as brothers and sisters. And it have allowed me to understand and to live my own Protestant reform tradition among Christian diversity. And I've put the desire for Christian unity at the center of my ministry at the Protestant Church of Geneva, especially in my ministry at the ecumenical community of people living with disability and in my actual ministry at the ecumenical workshop of theology. As moderatrice, Pastor of Pastors, I have a strong interest in the activities of Theoagé, Witness Together in Geneva, which was founded by Lucas Fischer. It's a project from my church that brings together Protestant churches in Geneva, originating from immigration. 
in Geneva, we will definitely be pushed into the direction for more attention to ecumenical work. The relationship with the Roman Catholic Church, the Christian Catholic Church of Geneva is already very strong. And we have decades of fruitful collaboration. But the interreligious reality of our region and the numerous communities with origins in immigration will definitely bring us to more focus on ecumenism. Not only is it about creating institutional contacts between church churches that have been historically present and are declining, but also about meeting other confessions, meeting other religions and other believers who are all present in our city and society. It's perhaps one way to regain the root of ecumenism, the oikumene, this place filled with diversity. We don't always know how to do this, and it might be uncomfortable. Sometimes it might be easier to stay among those who resemble us. But in thinking back to this teaching of professors Holland Weger and Kali Lombe, it's all about going out there to meet men and women, to meet living and believing communities and other ways of living the faith in God. It's about sharing what gives us life and feeds our faith. Maybe this is the gift given to the Protestant reform tradition to be a bridge and to open spaces and times of dialogue between very different, sometimes opposing or even rival communities. My wish for my church and for Geneva is the following, may Christ walk with us to this mission of actively listening to others, meeting others, and in renewing us constantly. In the name of the loving God, may you be blessed and have a good time taking part to this webinar. May the week of prayer for Christian unity be inspired, daring, and joyful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mottier, and thank you for that very personal testimony of uh, the role that ecumenism um, has played in your own life and the importance of that for your church. As I said at the beginning, and as uh, Father Johan echoed, we are particularly honoured that Professor Maloney and Dr. Faraci are with us today, even if only online to present the first volume of the history of the desire for Christian unity, the dawn of Christian unity. I will now give the floor to Professor Maloney and Dr. Faraci to present the project and introduce this volume. It's a, it's a very weighty volume in every sense of the word at 770 pages. And I would just like to say that the extensive table of contents is online and can be downloaded from the event page for this webinar from the website of the World Council of Churches. And I think the link to the event page may be posted in the chat now so that you're able to um, download the table of contents and get a view of the vast array of subjects, issues, and personalities that have been treated in this first volume. Let me just introduce uh, Professor Maloney and Dr. Faraci. Professor Maloney is Secretary of the Foundation for Religious Studies in Bologna, Italy, and Professor of the History of Christianity at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. He's also the holder of the UNESCO Chair on Religious Pluralism and Peace at the University of Bologna. And many of us will know him for his active involvement in the creation of the European Academy of Religion. Dr. Faraci is an affiliated researcher at the Foundation for Religious Studies in Bologna and a research fellow at the Department of Education and Humanities of the University of Modena and Riccio Emilia 
And I believe that his study on the genesis and history of the convergence document on baptism, Eucharist and ministry is due to be published anytime if it's not already available. So let me give the floor to Professor Maloney and Dr. Faraci to introduce the project, say something about the first volume and something about your hopes for the next two volumes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Brown. Thank you to all uh, the people involved in this uh, event, to the speakers. I will only take a few minutes to tell something about this research prog program uh, launched uh, around 2007. So with 15 years uh, of research in, uh, yes, in its uh, background. Uh, the idea of working on what is market, the history of the churches in the 20th century uh, is a natural consequence for many of us and for me in particular of the research that we've done on the history of the Second Vatican Council. It is since there, since the old preparation, the ecumenical preparation, that have involved many of us in, uh, in the Institute at that moment, uh, that is in the back of this uh, research program, that is not an act of nostalgia or an act of memory of uh, a glorious past, but wants to offer all the tools and all the most uh, important and uh, robust tools uh, for understanding what is something that has marked the recent history of the search and that we can call uh, properly unprecedented. As maybe you remember, uh, in 1963, Father Congar was asked to give a lecture to the student of the Collegio Capranica in Rome. And uh, he, the suspected Dominicans, uh, uh, condemned by Rome so many times, uh, started saying to this uh, student that uh, the apostles did not have the problems that we had, and did not have the grace that we had in the 20th century uh, in terms of a desire for Christian unity, of understanding the vision as a scandal that was demanding not simply kindness or just simply uh, non-violent relationship and conflicts among churches, but uh, demands a step uh, and a leap forward uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, unity. And for doing this, uh, we have started with the two typical uh, instrument of historical research. On one, sti on one side, uh, we have tried to uh, take a profound knowledge of a great historiographical effort that has been made in the past uh, years, mostly and especially from uh, Geneva, as a sort of autobiography of uh, the ecumenical movement as a such. Uh, and with the, all the characters and subjectivity this, that this uh, had. On the other side, we started to work on aspects that we considered very particular and very important for understanding this uh, event. Uh, Professor Brown was mentioning the book of uh, Professor Ferracci on uh, the, the BEM uh, that is actually published. And I can mention also the great research of Sina Scatena on the Tese community published recently in French and in uh, Italian. Not only this, but also uh, research on the agreement of Italian communion between Catholic and Orthodox of 1970, uh, other research of what was happening in the ecumenical movement in uh, uh, South uh, Africa, in Latin America, all this type of uh, difficulties uh, of making a global history of this desire persuaded us to put ecumenism only in the second line of the title and to put the desire in the first line, because uh, the idea of the desire is not uh, a concession to an historiography of emotion uh, that he is uh, a la page in this moment among many historians, but is an effort <clears throat> to understand what has moved real persons. Uh, making a sort of uh, holocaust of their own lives uh, for this purpose of Christian uh, unity. And the, Luca will explain this uh, later, going from a preamble, acknowledging what is a long tradition, uh, building languages, efforts, intuitions, 
that are prepared what is properly uh, the work of the ecumenical movement and entering into the 20th century from the door of the First World War. In a moment like this, in which again the war and the war among uh, Christians is at our doors, uh, to remember the fact that uh, one of the strengths of the ecumenical movement and the ecumenical effort has been to connect the disaster of the history to the scandal of division, to uh, postulate and uh, with the spiritual, theological and political instrument, the connection uh, between the catastrophe of uh, the world and the tragedies of the humanities and the scandal of uh, division. For this reason, what we have tried to offer is uh, a, a three volume history of this uh, event that is the manifestation of the desire, uh, treating ecumenism as something that is not in our past, but it is in our past, our present and our uh, future. Uh, that he has originated in the context of the conflict between church and modernity, and now living in a very different context, the context where, again, the challenge of understanding the division among the church and among Christians is open for all of us. And uh, I give the floor to Luca, but not before thanking again uh, the audience, the World Council of Churches for hosting uh, this launching event in, in Geneva, even if virtual uh, Geneva, uh, sooner or later this will, will uh, end, but the gratitude will attend for this uh, moment to all of you. Thank you very much, Stephen. So um, thank you, just a couple of minutes to show you the plan of the series and the work to be done in the next few, um, few, few years. I will try to share my screen. Okay. Um, volume two, um, which will release next year, we resume the chronological thread of uh, volume number one, and we'll start with a section um, with a section dedicated to the circles and the centers in the of the interwar period, uh, where the theological and spiritual mainstream of the European ecumenism were developed. And so there will be chapter on uh, les solchoirs on. Um, um, Chevetogne, Istina, Padermore, before and after the Second World War, on Thesé, and obviously on the history of the WCC from uh, Amsterdam to, to the Assembly of New Delhi. Then section number five will address what we called uh, an ecumenical spring, using a language clearly indebted to Congar and an expression very common in the historiography of the ecumenical movement to define the age marked by the Second Vatican Council. In a sense, this section gives the volume its title, that is Path Toward Communion. And in fact, it focuses on the dialogues from Vatican II to the, um, to the Loyenberg Agreement, with which volume two will end. Volume three will be split in two tomes, given the large number of chapters and pages, and will be published in 2024. Its, dial, its title is Dialogue and Experiences and focuses on the several ecumenical experiments of cooperation, dialogue or communion coming from the churches either in the European or in the global context. This volume will be entirely dedicated to the global outreach of the so-called grassroots ecumenism, both in terms of um, dissemination with chapters on experiences in Latin America, uh, in Middle East, Africa, Asia, and in terms of its inter intertwining with the, with the ideologies and the political conflicts of the 20th century. So there will be chapter on the humanism and the Cold War, the decolonization, um, ecumenism, the ecumenical movement and issues like religious freedom on the other side on the Iron Curtain and in Latin American dictatorships. Um, apartheid in South Africa, and so on. 
Due space will be given to the so-called newer churches and the non-denominational initiatives uh, and their impact on the ecumenical movement. Um, the conclusion of, uh, the, 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 this, of the, the, the of the series and um, will may have may say something about how we have conceived this history of ecumenism. We think that unity and the path to unity is an open horizon, and we do not confuse the disillusion of particular groups of actors of the ecumenical dialogue, like theologians, prophets, pioneers, spiritualists, and church hierarchs, with the death of a desiderium that after each failure just furthers a little its object. Before concluding my five minutes introduction, let me give just two numbers and a couple of uh, explanations. The languages from which we have translated the essays into English and Italian are German, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. It's important to say that we have already, we already received the article. So it, it remains the, for us to do the editing work on the next two volumes. And the scholars involved in this project are in total 128. We chose them not on, um, uh, on gender or uh, denominational criteria, but uniquely on the basis of their ability um, in, um, in, um, in using the tools of um, the, the, the tools of the um, historical research and in distancing themselves from the concrete objective of the ecumenical movement, just like a generation of historians from Etienne Fouillou onwards have uh, done. And they say, is true for the balance of topics in each volume. Um, as, you, as, you, as, soon, as, you, as you can see in the list of contents, the table of contents, we did not try to be exhaustive, thematic, and not even erudite, since our intention was not to realize an encyclopedia or a companion to global Christianity or a collection of disconnected articles about churches and ecumenists, but a history in which the different chapters should build on each other and form a larger historical narrative of turning points, key figures, and generations. This is, in short, what we had to tell you on behalf of our research team about this project and most of all what lies ahead in the next few years. So Stephen, I concluded my presentation and I'm looking forward to hearing what our distinguished speakers has to say about our work, our, this first volume. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maloney. Thank you very Good morning. much. Morning. Good, how are you? Um, thank you, Professor Maloney. Thank you, Luca, um, for the introduction to the, the project and what's to come. Um, I must say that um, looking at the table of contents myself, as someone who's been brought up in the historiography of the World Council of Churches, where often we focus on 1910, as the beginning of the 20th century ecumenical movement. I thought the range of articles um, that you have in this first volume covering movements and initiatives in the 19th century, not only Protestant, but also Orthodox and Catholic, is a real great resource for the um, looking at our history as an ecumenical movement and thinking about the many different women and men, as Professor Maloney put it, who've been manifesting this desire for Christian unity. So thank you for the introduction. Um, we now have a panel of three distinguished respondents um, from a Roman Catholic, a Protestant, and an Orthodox uh, perspective. Um, they are Professor Michael Krasinski, who's been Professor of Systematic Theology, at the Catholic University of Freiburg since 2018. Professor Elisabeth Pomontier, who's Professor of Practical Theology at the University of Geneva since 2015. And since June 2021 has been Dean of the Faculty of Theology, the first woman to occupy this post. And His Eminence Archbishop Job of Telmesos, who was born in Montreal, Canada, 
has been the representative of the Ecumenical Patriarchate to the World Council of Churches since November 2015, the, has been the co-president of the Joint International Commission for the Theological Dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church since 2016, and in 2019 he was appointed Dean of the Institute of Graduate Studies of Orthodox Theology in Chambézy. In a few minutes, each will offer their reactions to and perspectives on this first volume of this history of ecumenism. But to begin with, I'd like to invite each to share for a few minutes on how they became involved in ecumenism and the importance of ecumenism for them in their life, their work and their study. And I'd like to begin with uh, Professor Krasinski, please. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your interest in what I have to say. I am happy to start by responding to the request to say something about myself and my involvement in ecumenism. Considering our global and ecumenical forum today, perhaps I should begin by saying that I am a European Catholic. As a European, as a German European, I have always been fascinated by our neighboring country, France. So I studied French language and literature. As a Catholic, I have been fascinated by our common Christian faith. So I studied theology. In Germany, we are lucky that both are studied at state faculties and taught at state schools. In a certain sense in Germany, the churches go to school and they go there together. After some years as a teacher, I now work as a professor of systematic theology at the Catholic University of Applied Sciences in Freiburg, which has a special focus on training for professions in the social and healthcare sectors. In these sectors, the common diaconical engagement of our churches is a good example of our common responsibility for the living together in our societies. Because I have always interested in history, I devoted my doctoral thesis to the question of how faith and history relate to each other. I did this using the example of the great Catholic ecumenist Yves Congar and his friends Marie-Dominique Chenu and Henri-Marie Ferret from the School of Theology Le Solchoir, and more specifically with, their regard, with regard to their collaboration at the Second Vatican Council. I consider the Council's combination of dogma and pastoral, which is based on ecumenical experience, to be forward-looking and am pleased that Pope Francis also seems to see it in this way. So-called non-Catholic observers also took part in the Second Vatican Council. With the support of the archives of the World Council of Churches, I was able to devote some studies on the great ecumenist Lucas Fischer, to the question of the extent to which these observers not only observed, but even actively participated in the Second Vatican Council and helped shape its results. Ecumen ecumenism is important to me for at least three reasons. Firstly, I come from a country where ecumenism is self-evident due to the historical denominational composition of the population. Secondly, I have learned, especially in my work with young people, that ecumenism represents a great potential for the future of our societies and for the future of Christianity in a changing world. Thirdly, as theologians, we can learn so much from each other about our common faith and about our common world that it would be irresponsible not to do theology in an ecumenical horizon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I was uh, particularly interested um, to hear of your experience of looking in the archives of the World Council of Churches, um, which I remember from my own doctoral studies has got a huge wealth of, of information and insights and papers. So thank you very much. I'd now like to offer uh, the floor to Elizabeth Parmentier. Um, to say something about your involvement of ecumenism. If I may, uh, 
I could just like to say that I think uh, my first encounter with you was in um, 1994 in Vienna at the Leuenberg uh, conference where you became uh, particularly involved in the Leuenberg Church Fellowship. So I know that you've got a long involvement in um, ecumenical issues and ecumenical action. So please, um, would be interested to know more about uh, the meaning of ecumenism for you in your life and your work and your research. Merci beaucoup, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, je vais parler français um, en remerciant l'équipe de traduction parce que je pense que c'est important que les langues différentes s'expriment aussi. Et à présent, je, je voudrais simplement donner trois aspects de la réalité œcuménique qui a été la mienne. La première chose, c'est que je suis née à la frontière entre l'Allemagne et la France, près de Strasbourg, en France, mais quand même dans une région marquée par la guerre et par la, les identités très relatives qui peuvent changer entre plusieurs générations. Et donc, euh, les, les, les personnes de ma famille, les générations précédentes, ont changé plusieurs fois de langue et de culture. Et donc, étant biculturelle et, et étant euh, grande amatrice de la, de la culture allemande, je ne pouvais pas être autre chose qu'ouverte à la différence. La deuxième chose, c'est que je n'ai jamais compris le, le message de l'Évangile autrement que… Euh, étant une ouverture à la différence de l'autre et à la réconciliation. Donc fondamentalement, je n'ai pas pu faire autrement que d'être engagée dans l'œcuménisme. Ça fait partie de la, de la foi chrétienne pour moi. Mais surtout, j'ai bénéficié de, de grâces formidables. C'est que quand j'ai été ordonnée pasteur en 1988, je suis de l'Église en Alsace, qui était à l'époque entièrement luthérienne. Maintenant, c'est une église unie, luthérienne et réformée. Et quand j'ai été ordonnée pasteur en 1988, j'ai eu besoin aussi de faire une thèse de doctorat. Mon directeur de thèse était André Birmelé, professeur André Birmelé, que tous les œcuménistes connaissent. Et j'ai donc bénéficié non seulement de son savoir, mais surtout, je suis arrivée au centre d'études œcuméniques à Strasbourg, où j'ai été assistante à partir de 1991. Et ça a été vraiment pour moi le, euh, comment dire, la révélation du travail œcuménique. J'ai pu travailler avec euh, non seulement André Birmelé, mais aussi avec Mike Root, qui était à l'époque là-bas, avec Jacob Tesfaye, avec Christo Sarinen. Euh, Harding Mayer était parti à la retraite, il y a eu Taylor Dieter toutes les personnes engagées dans des dialogues internationaux. Et donc, ça a été une école pour mon identité personnelle, mon appartenance luthérienne, puisque tout, tout cet institut est au service de la Fédération luthérienne mondiale et de ses églises, mais ça a été aussi une ouverture extraordinaire pour les dialogues. Et la troisième chose, c'est ce que Steven a mentionné, c'est qu'en tant que femme, j'ai aussi eu cette chance d'être une femme, euh, c'est important de le dire, puisque les femmes étaient déléguées, envoyées par leurs églises, et j'ai été envoyée dans de nombreuses assemblées internationales, en particulier aussi euh, après les années 90 dans les assemblées de Leuenberg, des églises de Leuenberg, la communion des églises de Leuenberg, et à partir de 1994, j'étais d'abord, par les, les hasards de, la, de cette euh, rencontre, j'ai été d'abord vice-présidente de la communion d'églises protestantes en Europe, c'est-à-dire ces églises de Leuenberg, et j'étais présidente de ces églises de 2001 à 2006, avec Wilhelm Hufmeyer comme secrétaire général, et donc ça a été une expérience sur le terrain. Voilà, je conclue en disant que euh, il va de soi pour moi que dans mon enseignement et ma recherche de théologienne pratique, ce qui m'intéresse avant toute chose, c'est la, la réalité des églises sur le terrain, euh, et qu'il y a un vrai œcuménisme à vivre non seulement entre les églises mais dans les églises et que de plus en plus nous sommes devant la difficulté de, de faire comprendre et vivre cet œcuménisme en tant que tel. Donc j'espère euh, pouvoir aussi comme chercheur euh, contribuer à cela de, et pas seulement dans mon engagement personnel.
Voilà, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, one thing that struck me from both of the previous presentations, one from a German side, one from the French side, is how this, this concern for ecumenism has also been linked to this intercultural reality of two neighboring um, countries with different languages, different traditions, but whose history is intertwined. Um, now I want to shift continents. His Eminence uh, uh, Archbishop Job, as I mentioned, was born in, uh, in Montreal in Canada, which is also part of a, a multi, multi linguistic bilingual country in Canada. Um, and invite, uh, invite you, Archbishop Job, to say something about um, how you became involved in ecumenism or the, the meaning and significance of ecumenism um, for your life and work. Thank you, Stephen. Well, actually, my ecumenical adventure started about 25 years ago when I moved from Canada and I came to Europe, when I came to study at St. Serge's Orthodox Theological Institute for postgraduate studies. And while I was being a student there, I was invited to attend first and then to participate in the very famous uh, liturgical uh, conferences, the uh, Semaines d'études liturgiques, the liturgical weeks of studies of Saint Serge, which are actually mentioned in this uh, nice book uh, which gathers us today, uh, which was, uh, which since uh, 1952 are a major place, meeting place for ecumenical exchanges. And I also engage in doctoral uh, program, in a joint doctoral program at the Catholic uh, University in Paris. And after graduating, after having uh, my PhD, I start, was invited to teach both at the Institut Saint-Serge and at the Institut Catholique de Paris, particularly at the Institut Supérieur de Liturgie and at the Institut Supérieur d'Études Ecumeniques, uh, which are uh, very famous institution, educational institution, which have contributed to the ecumenical movement in the 20th century. And most recently, uh, I was called to teach at the Institute of Postgraduate Studies uh, in Orthodox Theology at the Orthodox Center in Chambézy, uh, which has a particular uh, tripartite uh, program in collaboration with the Protestant faculty of the University of Geneva and the Catholic uh, theological faculty of the University of Freiburg. And while I started my uh, teaching career in different uh, institutions, which uh, had a great impact uh, on the ecumenical movement in the 20th century, um, I was uh, first uh, invited to be one of the founding members of the St. Irenaeus group of theological dialogue between the Roman Catholics and the Orthodox, uh, a study group of uh, theologians, uh, which uh, came uh, into being in 2003, while the Joint International Commission uh, was frozen, had the large difficulty. So I was a founding member of the Saint Irenaeus group. And I, at the same time, I became, I was sent as a delegate from the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople to the Assembly of Porto Alegre of the World Council of Churches and became a member of the Central Committee. So this is how I was initiated to this great institution of, of the World Council of Churches. And naturally, all these events led more recently when I became an Orthodox bishop uh, to be appointed by the Ecumenical Patriarchate first as the permanent delegate, uh, delegate uh, permanent representative uh, to the World Council of Churches in Geneva, and more recently to be appointed uh, as the co-president, the co-chair of the Joint International Commission for the Theological Dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. So this was a great adventure and I look forward for the next events in this ecumenical adventure. Thank you very much, uh, Archbishop Job, and thank you uh, to all of the panelists. 
I think that, uh, that what we've heard um, shows that ecumenism is not just a, a field of academic study, but is something, um, as Professor Maloney says in, in the introduction, that touches on the lives of, of women and men. Um, but now I would like to turn to the book and um, to invite each of you um, to give your comments, your reactions, your questions about the first volume. And I'll do that in the same order as we had the um, introductions just now. So first of all, I will um, pass the floor to uh, Professor Krasinski. Thank you. I prepared a, a PowerPoint, which I will show you. And I hope it works. Well, the desire of, for Christian unity is often invoked, but in the face of an ever greater diversification and singularization of our lives, this desire seems to, to have lost what we call in German, its Sitz im Leben, its setting in life. And with its Sitz im Leben, however, the desire itself is in danger of being lost. It seems all the more necessary to clarify the nature of this desire. At the same time, it seems all the more necessary to clarify what unity actually means. If it can be said with good reason that ecumenism is in crisis today, it is little consolation that the whole of humanity is in crisis too. Rather, the crisis of humanity leads us to the question, shouldn't the desire of, for Christian unity be all the more a Christian desire for unity? Could ecumenism even be a sign and instrument for the unity of a humanity that needs this very unity more than ever in its history? Since the waste number of aspects contained in our book we present today can hardly be reduced to a common denominator, I would like to ask to what extent it can contribute to answering this very question. To this end, I begin with a thesis by Alberto Meloni, who points out that the history of the desire for Christian unity is a history, I quote, not so much of concepts of models, but of that of a history of men and women who carry this desire within themselves and want to make it a reality. This said, the desire for unity may be at work in the hearts of individuals, but individuals are woven into a wide variety of ecclesial and social cultural, spiritual and institutional, geographical and political contexts. The present volume has the merit of illuminating the most diverse facets of this interplay of inter in individual personalities and structures, movements and congresses, projects and networks, but also atmospheres and mentalities. Of course, well-known individual personalities are presented, famous meetings and conversations are considered, influential currents are analyzed. In many of the corresponding contributions, we discover the interaction of individual and partly well-known actors on the one hand, and of many unnamed and anonymous, anonymous actors on the other hand. Here, of course, it also becomes clear that no history of the desire for Christian unity can adequately capture the spiritual and inspiring contributions of the many unnamed people who generated the desire for unity in one way or another. Incidentally, this also applies to people who had to suffer from expressions of Christianity and realizations of churches within the framework of a colonialist worldview in the 19th century. However, this last aspect must also lead to the insight that anyone who studies the history of the churches in their opposition and cooperation is first and foremost taught humility. The churches individually and together often did not do justice to the gospel. And yet they were the context of life in which the gospel was proclaimed and believed, lived and considered. Ecumenical historiography is therefore something, somehow a historiography of the reception of the gospel. A history of the desire for Christian unity must therefore really be a historiography and make use of standard historical methods. In doing so, however, it faces the challenge of describing the history of a desire, which according to those who carry it within themselves is in connection with God and thus with a reality that is according to Christian faith, both, both imminent in history 
and transcendent of history. For if the desire for Christian unity in history is about God, or if this desire has something to do with God in history, then ecumenism and its history is an eminently theological matter. In order to understand the history of ecumenism, the non-theological factors are both historical and theological factors. In my opinion, this volume does justice to all the challenges linked to these developments I just tried to describe. I would like to exemplify this with three keywords that play a role in individual contributions of the volume, but especially also in its basic hermeneutical considerations, namely crisis, conversion, communion. In his exposition of the working hypothesis, Alberto Meloni characterizes the history of the desire for Christian unity as a history of a crisis, I quote, that truly runs through all the churches, which in every person who embraces it, defines the priorities and doctrines, compromises and deeds, convictions and evaluations of which historical research has much to say, end quote. Indeed, past history proves to be a magistra vitae, as Pope John XXIII called it in the opening address, Gaudet Mater Ecclesia of the Second Vatican Council. In this way, historiography, which captures the distinctions and discernments lived in history, offers clarifications, inspirations, and surprise, surprises. I think there are many of them in this volume. The second term, conversion. As a Catholic, I share Etienne Fouillou and Luca Ferracci's assessment in this volume that one of the most surprising phenomena presented was the Catholic Church's conversion to ecumenism. Indeed, the encyclical Mortalium Animos of 1928 and the decree Unitatis Fed Integratio of 1964 of the Second Vatican Council are worlds apart. The question of the two authors as to whether the word conversions was correctly chosen conceals the hermeneutical problem of the connection between theology and history. The question also points to the fact that we can never completely catch up with, history, with historical and social reality with words, even though we cannot, of course, do without words. Conversion is therefore always also conversation. For you and Ferracci go on to ask, however, does such a conversion not, not deserve close observation? And I would therefore extend for you and Farage's question, if conversation is part of conversion, would not the conversion of an ecumenical partner always be part of the com common conversion which needs dialogue? And this need, leads me to my third point, communion. I also, I said that I am a, a Catholic and the word Catholic is uh, thanks to the ecumenical movement has been freed from its denominational constriction. At the same time, this term, which combines fullness and diversity, refers to the question of what kind of unity is desired by Christians following Jesus. Various terms such as communio or colonia could be mentioned here. Probably none of the terms alone is sufficient to express what each of them is trying to denote. John Vizulas, in the wake of his Eucharistic eschatological definition of the goal of the ecumenical movement, arrives here at the perspective opening definition of unity. Indeed, unity is not uniformity, but an expression of God's fullness of life. And Christian unity is in service of the unity of the humanity. Or in the words of John Vizulas, I quote, it is communion with Christ, in fact, which holds together in faith the present and the future of humanity in the sense that communion with the risen one is a real but open communion. It is a communion already present, but not yet accomplished, as is the unity of the church, which is the image and anticipation of the kingdom." End quote. When I come to my last observations, the volume we present today sets standards in terms of content and hermeneutics against which any future contribution to the history of the desire of, for Christian unity must be measured. This concerns both historiography and theology, and it concerns even more their interaction. Precisely in the latter sense, my only question uh, in, in an hermeneutical order is, 
Perhaps why Lucas Fischer's hermeneutical reflections on an ecumenical historiography did not play a more explicit role, for they are precisely at the crossroad of historiography of ecumenism and ecumenical theology. But this question in no way diminishes the merits of the volume. As to historiography, even after this volume, there's of course still lots of work to do. As to theology, after reading this first volume, one can come to the conclusion that unity is a never attainable and yet indispensable goal of Christian life and thought. What role does the history of the desire for Christian unity play for this goal? Why devote oneself to this history and look back? Would it not be more important to look resolutely forward? The Catholic ecumenist Yves Congar likes to recall that for Bernard of Clairvaux, the church should be ante et retro oculata, that is looking forward and back at the same time. The volume provides a convincing answer to the question of what looking back is helpful for, namely looking forward. Echoing the motive of crisis in the context of present and future inculturation, John Zizula's insists on the eschatological dimension of Christian faith, which gives a direction to this looking forward. For the Metropolitan of Pergamon, the, I quote, the church does not draw its being and inspiration from the cultural realities of the past alone, but from the end of history, from its relationship with the kingdom of God announced in the gospel. Doing so, next quotation, the mission of, mission of evangelization should respect people's freedom to express their faith in the way that, it, that suits them best provided that the fundamental perspective of their worldview remains that of the gospel. Inculturation, therefore, requires discernment, a discernment that the spirit provides through theological consciousness, orthodoxy, in the original sense of the term. But isn't, a kind, isn't it a kind of instrumentalization of historiography if we underline its role for evangelization and inculturation? This is a real danger. But we also have a responsibility for the future of history. And that's why I think Alberto Meloni asks a question with it both historical and historiograph historiographical and theological. That is, that the main question is the very possibility of attempting a vision of the whole, not a synthesis, but one capable of historically giving voice to a historical reality marked by non-linear time, one consisting of urgencies and delays, of premature acts and lost opportunities, of heightened formations and unexpected conversions." End quote. In order to deal with such a vision of the whole, which is of course impossible, could it be helpful to ask the gospel for inspiration, since ecumenism can be the history of the gospel? Now that the end of history, Francis Fukuyama, has itself already become history and the age of master narrative is over. The gospel could be rediscovered as a master or grand narrative made up of many small narratives and which makes these small narratives great. A historical as well as theological consideration of these big and small narratives relates historical critical criteria on the one hand and theological criteria such as crisis discernment and communion on, communion on the other hand, and in a time of increasing uncertainty about the self-understanding of the human being, couldn't this be an important joint Christian contribution of the ecumenical partners to critically and constructively shape the future history, not only of the churches, but also of the world. And I think the present volume is a very good contribution to that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Krasinski. I think there was a very interesting um, question that you raised there. Maybe we come back to it later. Um, of unity as a never realizable goal um, and the eschatological perspective. And of course, coming from the World Council of Churches, I would ask, what does that then mean for institutions like the World Council of Churches? But that's something we can maybe uh, discuss later. Uh, Professor Parmentier, um, let me now give the floor to you. Merci beaucoup, Stephen. Et um, je voudrais donc, uh, uh, en remerciant uh, mon collègue qui a déjà apporté uh, des, un éclairage important, 
euh, apporter sept points positifs, sept choses qui me paraissent vraiment importantes euh, dans cette conception du, du, du volume et ensuite donner trois points de, de discussion. Alors, les sept points, je voudrais tout ce sera très bref. Je voudrais d'abord remercier le professeur Mélanie et également le docteur Ferracci pour cet énorme travail éditorial et de mise en relation, euh, un travail colossal euh, avec tout ce comité éditorial de personnalité, de l'œcuménisme, pour cette euh, œuvre qui sera tout à fait essentielle. Ce qui me paraît le plus important dans ce travail, c'est que euh, on a un regard d'historien qui ne sera pas un regard idéologique sur l'œcuménisme et qui, tout en, tout en affirmant néanmoins l'importance de l'œcuménisme comme mouvement euh, fondamental pour les églises et pour la société. Et le fait que ce soit de l'histoire, de l'historiographie, dit bien le sens de l'œcuménisme et du christianisme comme mouvement qui a des histoires, des histoires, des histoires dans la diversité, au double sens du terme, et aussi une histoire de changement permanent, un changement qui n'est pas forcément vers, du bas vers le haut ou un changement idéalisé, mais un changement dans la réalité. Et donc, euh, ni l'œcuménisme ni le christianisme n'est intouchable, puisque nous pouvons en y réfléchir comme histoire. Ça, ça, ça me paraît décisif. Le deuxième point, c'est que cette historiographie ne prend pas seulement des documents, des textes, des programmes, des institutions, mais qu'elle est aussi écrite par des auteurs qui sont engagés humainement et professionnellement, qui se sont donnés à cet œcuménisme. Beaucoup d'auteurs de ces chapitres ont été des, des artisans de ces histoires. Et donc ça, c'est important, tout en ayant également des historiens qui regardent avec plus de distance. Troisième point, j'ai beaucoup apprécié, en tant qu'auteur, que nous ayons la longueur des articles qui permet d'écrire une histoire d'un phénomène dans son développement. Et que ça n'est pas caricatural, parce que nous pouvons montrer toutes les nuances de ce développement. Donc, c'était très, très bien de pouvoir éviter qu'on accentue simplement certains aspects et qu'on montre les évolutions des phénomènes. Quatrième point, c'est que vous avez choisi aussi de présenter l'écuménisme comme un phénomène mondial. Vous avez fait place déjà dans ce premier volume à d'autres cultures et d'autres contextes que uniquement européens. Et le, le placer d'office dans ce regard global et indispensable, me semble-t-il, pour comprendre euh, tout le sens de l'œcuménisme. Le cinquième point, c'est euh, ce qui a déjà été souligné euh, à la fois par euh, le professeur Mélanie et le docteur Ferracci, c'est l'importance du lien avec les réalités politiques et culturelles. C'est-à-dire que ça a été à la fois positif pour l'œcuménisme, notamment le lien avec la guerre, les guerres mondiales qui ont incité à l'œcuménisme, comme cela a été également négatif en certains égards, que la politique et les réalités culturelles aient joué un rôle décisif. Et très longtemps, l'œcuménisme a eu l'illusion qu'on pouvait régler les problèmes entre les églises par la doctrine seulement. Et donc, il a fallu tout un temps de réflexion pour faire intervenir ce qu'on appelait autrefois les facteurs non théologiques les facteurs historiques ou culturels, qui sont aujourd'hui décisifs et j'y reviendrai à la fin. Le sixième point qui m'a paru très important, euh, c'est le lien avec les autres religions. Dans ce premier volume déjà, on parle du Parlement des religions, euh, du Parlement mondial des religions, et donc on voit déjà le, 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 que l'œcuménisme le, ne peut que se situer dans un contexte plus large des autres religions. Alors, selon les époques, c'était plutôt par rapport à l'athéisme, le matérialisme, avec le, la, le, le problème de, de, des pays de l'Est et le rideau de fer. Aujourd'hui, ce serait le lien avec les autres religions et peut-être même l'enjeu de la spiritualité au sens large du terme. Mais ça, on y viendra dans un autre volume, je suppose. Et le dernier point, 
qui me semble aussi très, très positif ici que le plus important de ce travail, c'est de participer à l'œuvre de réception. Ça n'est pas uniquement une historiographie qui documente, qui informe, qui donne des éléments de connaissance, mais c'est aussi une histoire qui montre la complexité de, du mouvement œcuménique. Et en, temps, en montrant la complexité, c'est une œuvre qui procède de la réception de l'œcuménisme. Voilà les points que je voulais souligner comme, comme points euh, vraiment importants pour les personnes qui n'ont pas lu ou qui n'ont pas encore connaissance de, ce, de cet énorme travail. Et je voulais relever simplement encore dans le temps qui me reste, très brièvement, euh, en cinq minutes, trois points euh, qui me paraissent importants. Le titre, « A history of the desire for Christian unity euh, ». Ce, ce titre de « desire », le « désir », me paraissait étonnant. Et je me suis dit, est-ce que c'est un titre qui cherche une attractivité commerciale Parce que le désir, commercialement, ça se vend bien pour un livre. Est-ce que c'était ça la question euh, Et en fait, euh, pourquoi n'avoir pas choisi un titre plus fort, l'impératif œcuménique la tâche œcuménique, l'histoire de la tâche œcuménique, l'histoire de, de la responsabilité œcuménique. Et en fait, la réponse est très, très bien expliquée. Et en fait, je me suis laissée convaincre par la réponse que le professeur Mélanie donne dès son introduction et qui situe l'herméneutique de tout le projet de manière assez impressionnante. C'est-à-dire que le titre est beaucoup plus profond qu'une certaine attractivité parce que ce que veut montrer le titre, c'est que, si j'ai bien compris, vous me direz, c'est que le, le, ce n'est pas une, une approche historique qui va entrer dans la rhétorique qu'on pouvait trouver traditionnellement, qui est par exemple cette, cette « narrative of return », comme dit le texte, l'imaginaire du retour des églises à l'unité, ou bien « narrative of suffering », l'imaginaire ou l'utopie, enfin l'utopie, la rhétorique de la souffrance, la souffrance des églises, et c'est vrai qu'on a beaucoup parlé du péché de la division. Ce n'est pas non plus la rhétorique de l'urgence, de et, euh, et ces trois écueils sont évités. C'est ce que dit le professeur Mélanie, il, que le projet veut éviter de présenter l'œcuménisme comme une nécessité ou comme un, une, une, une utilité. Et j'ai trouvé ça très intéressant, parce que pour moi, euh, comme théologienne, ça a toujours été une urgence et une nécessité. Et je me suis dit, voilà les historiens qui nous disent, nous voulons le présenter sous un autre aspect, nous ne voulons pas le justifier, mais nous voulons le mesurer, le présenter dans sa gratuité. Et c'est ce que dit la page... Euh, la page 16, euh, après avoir euh, discuté longtemps, euh, l'insistance, euh, c'est sur le fait que l'œcuménisme est présenté, non pas comme quelque chose qui doit être, mais comme quelque chose qui euh, suscite, qui, qui est un désir et qui fait partie de la crise qui a été mentionnée par mon collègue, qui traverse toutes les églises et qui traverse toutes les personnes. Et en fait, ce n'est pas une. Donc, cette crise il se montre que l'œcuménisme n'est pas une idée pacifique ou un idéal un peu libéral, qui, qui, que ce serait bien de faire la paix entre les églises, mais que c'est vraiment quelque chose qui, qui traverse les personnes et qui est un désir profond. Et ça, j'ai trouvé remarquable comme point de départ historique euh, que ce soit présenté dans sa gratuité d'abord. Voilà, alors je voulais souligner ça parce que c'est très bien expliqué dans la partie d'introduction herméneutique du projet. Si j'ai bien compris ce, 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 cette question. Avec la difficulté pour moi comme théologienne, que c'est la question à laquelle je vais venir à la fin, est-ce que ce désir n'existe plus, puisque aujourd'hui le cuménisme n'est plus attractif, euh, ou est-ce que ce désir existe mais qu'il y a d'autres choses qui, qui le bloquent euh, qui bloque le cuménisme. Alors ça, je vais y venir. Mon deuxième point sera plus court. Mon deuxième point, c'est la question évidemment de la théologie, que mon collègue a déjà soulevée, 
puisque c'est un travail d'historien, quelle place ce travail peut-il faire aux théologiens et aux, aux questions théologiques Et je trouve que finalement, il fait de la place, et je salue le fait que le premier exposé soit celui de John Zizi Oulas, qui pose la question du point de vue de la théologie, des modèles d'unité, des critères d'unité, et donc on a une sorte de posture de, de, de départ qui est intéressante et qui pose les, qui pose les questions. Et en fait, euh, euh, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'on a une analyse de l'histoire comme du christianisme à partir de ses effets. L'œcuménisme est analysé à partir de ses effets, mais la théologie peut ensuite avoir sa place parce qu'il y a des articles et des auteurs qui vont travailler sur les modèles d'unité, sur les propositions qui existent, et les notes de bas de page sont aussi très précieuses. On a des réflexions de fond sur les méthodes, sur les programmes, qui sont soit dans les exposés, soit dans les, les notes de bas de page, sur évidemment les différentes herméneutiques, les liens avec la théologie. Alors là, je ne, vais, je ne peux pas parler davantage parce que ça me mènerait trop loin et je ne veux pas prendre trop de temps. Mais le dernier point, qui, me, qui, me, qui, qui est pour moi une, une question difficile, c'est est-ce euh, qu'à la page 15 de l'introduction, si le professeur Mélanie dit « l'œcuménisme tient et tombe avec la modernité ». Alors, est-ce que ça, ça va être une, une posture qui, qui va tenir tout l'ensemble le, tout du projet ou est-ce que c'est uniquement pour ce premier volume que ça vaut que, que vaut cette affirmation en quelque sorte le communisme est un, en lien intrinsèque avec la modernité c'est une grande question parce que en phénomène de postmodernité comment est-ce que nous voyons aujourd'hui la, la, les difficultés œcuméniques en un temps où on n'a plus euh, la même attraction œcuménique, on a l'impression que l'œcuménisme est épuisé. Je me suis posé la question, est-ce que c'est la fin aujourd'hui de l'œcuménisme ou la fin des méthodes Ça, c'est une grande question. Est-ce qu'il faut trouver d'autres méthodes, euh, d'autres manières d'aborder la vérité de l'Évangile, d'autres manières d'aborder l'unité Ou est-ce que c'est tout simplement l'unité elle-même qui n'a qui plus de pertinence la notion même d'unité qui n'a plus de pertinence. Alors ça, ça n'est pas pour ce volume, j'attends la suite des volumes, mais c'est une question, je crois, qui est sous-jacente à l'ensemble et qui mériterait discussion ultérieure. Voilà, merci. Merci pour tout ça. Très bien, merci, Elisabeth. Thank you very much. Um, one small point I take from what you've said is when you talked about... Um, history or histories and so one question I would add would be how do we develop a history of ecumenism of the desire for Christian unity amongst all of these varying and differing histories but that's maybe for another time. Now I would like to uh, bring uh, Archbishop Job into the discussion and ask for your reflections um, on this volume. Thank you, Stephen. The more I study the history of the Orthodox Church in particular, and the more I study the history of Christianity in general, the more I am convinced that history is a question of networks. When you are looking at a specific place, and then you look to another specific place, geographical or in time, um, in time and space, you discover very often uh, the same figures, you cross upon the same figures. And I think this is what struck me while reading this volume on the history of the desire for Christian unity, is how much you see the networks. When we speak about the ecumenical movement as the church's meeting, as the encounter of ecclesiastical institution, well, the churches are not meeting in an abstract or idealistic way. It's always people who are meeting. And therefore, uh, the history of the ecumenical movement, of uh, the history of ecumenism is always linked to a network 
of people meeting, of person, real per persons. Of course, this volume deals with the 19th century and the 20th century. In those days, there were no Facebook, there were no social media, but people nevertheless were meeting. They were meeting either face to face in person, or they were meeting through writings and scholarly work. And I was fascinating, I was fascinated while reading this volume to see three ways how these networks were developing. Of course, if we look at the 19th century and even at the 20th century, we see some what we can call defectors or those who we consider perhaps sometimes in a negative way. For example, there is Newman, who is the central figure of the Oxford movement, who uh, leaves the Anglican church and becomes a Roman Catholic cardinal. Uh, you find this René François Guetté, who you know better as Father Vladimir Guetté, who was a French Roman Catholic priest, which becomes a Russian Orthodox priest. Or in the other way around, you have Jean-Xavier Gagarin, who was a Russian who became a Roman Catholic priest. Or more recently, Lev Gillet, who was a Benedictine Roman Catholic monk priest who became uh, an Orthodox hieromonk. Of course, these people, although their personal story uh, might be today considered in a little negative or in a critical way because they left one church to convert to another church. Nevertheless, their personal story was an encounter. And while doing this, they were bringing um, ecclesiastical tradition, churches closer or in a relation in a way or in, a, in another. The other way these networks work is through the influence of scholarly work. I was amazed that in uh, reading this book, how, for example, Muller could have influenced Khamyakov with his idea of the unity of the church, or Zom that has influenced Afanasyev on the structure of the church through the Eucharist, and then Afanasyev influenced Vatican II. Or I discovered something I didn't know, that, for example, the journals of a Russian Orthodox priest, saint known as St. John of Kronstadt, were published in France by Antoine Stark. And we can go on and go on and go, go on through the influence of uh, work, uh, through influence of publication. And finally, we have the pontifex, not in an ecclesiastical uh, point of view. No, I'm not speaking about some bishops who have uh, played a, an, a, an important role. Not only about the bishops, there are some, but not only, but person who were building bridges between the different traditions. For example, John Mott from the Christian student movement, which was in connection with the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople and who were, played a, a very important role being in contact with Evlogi Georgievsky, the metropolitan in, of the Russian immigrant in Paris, in the foundation of the St. Sergius Theological Orthodox Institute. Or two Roman Catholic monks, Lambert Baudouin and Bernard Bott, who played a very important role in the organization of the Semaine d'Etudes Liturgiques at the Institut Saint-Serge. Or even more, the encounter between Germanos Strenopoulos, one of the figures behind the famous encyclical of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of 1920, uh, addressed to all the churches, all the Christian, all the churches of Christ, who was inspired through an encounter with the Lutheran bishop, Nathan Soderblom. So all these meeting points, all these uh, networks played a tremendous work uh, impact uh, on the, the history of the ecumenical movement, of the history of ecumenism. And this is why 
this is very precious that we have all these different stories in this book. And it's very precious that the, at the end, we have a very fine index, which helps finding the different persons in the different uh, contexts, which are um, uh, addressed in the book. Personally, I have, uh, this, this would be my general appreciation of the work and I look forward for the next two volumes because I think uh, the, 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 the quality of this publication is to uh, put light on all these networks. Reading the first volume, I was amazed, struck by three important questions that came up to me and which we, uh, which uh, this book made me reflect on. First of all, of course, maybe it's not, um, it's not surprising since it's a book on a history, but I was amazed how much the historical method which developed in the 19th century uh, was important for um, the ecumenical movement. In fact, uh, the origins uh, of the ecumenical movement are linked with a historical re uh, reflection on the quest of the origins of Christianity, the quests of the origin of church unity. As an example, I will give um, the example of Dollinger, who uh, says, well, the Orthodox Church is quite fine because it corresponds to the early church. So this was the mind set at the origins of the ecumenical movement. Elizabeth was speaking about uh, the evolution of methods. I don't know if the uh, historical method plays so much a role today in the ecumenical movement, but definitely it, it played a, a, um, a very important role at the, the origins of the ecumenical movement. And leading to the que this quest of the origins, of course, there was the biblical studies, the patristic studies, and the liturgical studies, which developed in the 19th and 20th century, which played an important role on the evolution of the ecumenical movement. And all these aspects are actually very well presented in this volume. Uh, secondly, I was amazed uh, to see uh, how, uh, especially in, in the article by Macridis, how, um, who describes a little bit the situation of orthodoxy in the 19th century, I was amazed how um, uh, Patriarch Joachim III, the ecumenical patriarch, facing the nationalistic tendencies within orthodoxy, uh, while he was uh, with his project of maintaining a pan-orthodox unity, this project of maintaining the pan-orthodox unity um, pushed him uh, to uh, look very seriously on the ecumenical, to be an active uh, actor of the ecumenical movement, that the quest of, uh, we can see that, say that both um, the ecumenical movement as a quest for Christian unity as a whole has played a role on the unity between the different local orthodox or local national uh, orthodox churches, and on the reverse, the, 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 the quest for pan-Orthodox unity um, uh, invited the Orthodox to be also involved on the, uh, in the ecumenical movement for uh, uh, global Christian unity. And last but not least, uh, I was also um, uh, impressed by... Uh, a critique or uh, a thought uh, made in the article by John Zizulas, the Metropolitan of Pergamon, about perhaps the lack of eschatological vision 
within the ecumenical movement, uh, when uh, sometimes we have a tendency, we see a tendency, for example, within the, the World uh, Council of Churches, uh, to make po political statements, uh, to be involved with uh, social justice here on earth, etc., etc., and forgetting that we are not only uh, on the way towards Christian unity, but most of all, we are on the way altogether towards the kingdom of God. So maybe this is something uh, to on which we should reflect more uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Archbishop Job. Um, thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you for the way in which you both illuminated the content of this first volume and also raised questions for further discussion. Unfortunately, looking at my watch, we've got more questions there than we can deal with today, but I think that shouldn't be seen as a problem, but as an invitation to continue the discussion further. Um, I'd like now to offer uh, Professor Maloney and Dr. Faraci one minute only, I'm afraid, maybe one and a half, for any reactions that you've got to the contributions that have been made. And then I will give the floor to uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, Odaya Mateus, the Director of the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches and the Interim Deputy General Secretary of the WCC. <coughs> thank Professor you, Maloney. Thank you, and thank you to Professor Kuzinski, to Professor Parmentier, uh, to his eminence uh, job for uh, their interventions. Uh, of, in, in one minute, I will not enter into the question, I only thank, uh, want to thank them for uh, the questions. I'm happy if uh, uh, we um, have had an opportunity to show how the historical work can have a positive and, so to say, natural interplay with theology that is not to be considered as something foreign or opposite, or to be only looked to as a matter of hierarchy between a type of knowledge. And what we try to offer, what we will hope to offer in the next volume, thanks to the immense work of those and those and of authors that have been mentioned uh, only in this uh, moment. Uh, this is to, to do something that is just history, but good uh, history. And in good history, there is, of course, a place also for other type of her approach in their hermeneutics. And uh, we do hope that this will be uh, enough to show, we'll take one point from uh, Professor Parmentier, uh, to show that uh, <clears throat> the relation between modernity and ecumenism is exactly the opposite that the one one can postulate if uh, if considered properly. Uh, ecumenism is born inside uh, modernity uh, because the schism uh, has something to do with uh, modernity and is marking the modern history from the 11th century on of the churches with the weight of uh, division, violence, murder, and horrors uh, that are, are the reason of the ecumenical reaction that we have uh, tried to describe in this uh, volume. So thank you again for all your remarks and uh, uh, point that we will reflect on. And the floor is yours. Luca Ferracci. Yeah, I will use only a few seconds to thank the authors. Um, many of them are here in this Zoom call and uh, to thank the three speakers for their notes, for their words that pushes us to do even better for the next two uh, volumes. And I would prefer spare time to hear uh, Dr. Mateus. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Mateus, um, may I invite you to share some closing thoughts um, on the significance of this history for the World Council of Churches. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I would like simply to restate <clears throat> the expression of the General Secretary of uh, joy and gratitude for this epoch making uh, publication. As uh, I work in the preparation of the next assembly of the World Council of Churches, uh, taking into account mega trends such as Anthropocene, 
the structural inequalities generated by neoliberalism, the consequences of the digital uh, revolution, uh, the growth uh, of uh, national populisms and authoritarian political solutions offered uh, in exchange to growing fear. I think that uh, the desire for Christian unity has a great future ahead of itself, and it may be called today to become a counter-cultural attitude that is extremely urgent uh, in our times. So I hope that uh, this uh, is uh, part or a great deal of uh, uh, what uh, may have to do with the word uh, ecumenism uh, in the coming times. And I hope that all of us will be confronted also with the question of uh, a decolonial approach to the notion of the search uh, for Christian unity. With uh, gratitude and uh, congratulations to all of you, I would like to thank you and um, wish all the best to this project. Thank you, Odaya. Thank you, Professor Maloney. Thank you, Dr. Faradji. Thank you, Father Johan, Pastor Mottier, the panelists, Michael Krasinski, Elizabeth Palmontier, Archbishop Gobe. Thank you to the interpreters. Um, without the interpreters, we would not be able to experience uh, this Pentecost of research on ecumenism. Thank you to the backstage team, uh, Marcelo and Albin, who've been uh, keeping the technology going, and to Christina, our language coordinator. And to remind you that the recording of this webinar will be available on the YouTube channel of the World Council of Churches. So the questions that we've raised won't be forgotten, but can continue to nurture our discussions. Thank you all. Thank you for participating. And that brings an end to today's webinar.